This is Bloomberg Equality. I'm Caroline Hyde. And I'm Romain Bostic. Every Thursday through the month of June, we're broadening our coverage of markets in the economy to take an all-inclusive look at what social equity and equality truly mean for companies, for investors, and ultimately for our collective global prosperity. We're going to go deep into several key topics, including fair access to capital and the divisive politics around gender identity. Today, Romain, we focus on the workplace. Look, actually, this is the second year we've focused on work. Last time, this time last year, we were talking about companies being all in on remote work, the gains made in accessibility and flexibility for caregivers. Last year, it was all about labor shortages, driving employee bargaining power and higher pay and benefits. But this year, things are looking a bit different. Return to office mandates are being brought in as bosses fret about productivity. And look, the US labor market, it's still relatively tight, but data from Challenger shows planned layoffs through May hit more than four times the number of job cuts seen during the same period last year. Interest rates, well, they're rising, budgets, they are shrinking, and the realities of work, they've changed. That pendulum is beginning to swing. So what does it mean for the push for inclusive practices that remain, perhaps for many, really benefited, particularly participation rates in women and people of color? Absolutely. I remember we had a lot of conversations about this as actually sort of one of the benefits of the pandemic actually was that it did actually help inadvertently, if you will, address some of those issues here. And now there's a lot of big questions right now as to whether some of that progress has been halted or even rolled back. You take a look at the participation rate here in the U.S. labor market, the differential that you see between women and what you see between men. I don't even have to tell you which color is which. I'm sure you can guess. And of course, things are certainly improved from where we were back in the 90s, even in the early 2000s. But it's still a pretty wide gap. And there are a lot of questions right now, Caroline, as to what the next catalyst is to help narrow it. Let's just talk about what the changes are and whether there's data to back up all of perhaps what feels anecdotal. Bloomberg opinion columnist Sarah Green Carmichael has done a lot of great work digging into some of the shifts in corporate culture, the effect on women, people of colour in particular. And well, can you enunciate that for us, Sarah, as to whether this sudden desire from many leaders to get people back in the office in person is perhaps affecting women, people of colour more? Yes, I think one of the things that we saw in the pandemic was that when people became, when bosses became more flexible about the time and location where work could get done, it brought people into the workforce who had been pushed out of it. Not only women, uh, people of color, but also people with disabilities, you know, people for whom basically the standard kind of eight to six in the office, putting in tons of FaceTime, you know, was a challenge for whatever reason. And what we saw was that those workers contributed enormously and that our economy needs them. And now these return to office mandates the push to go first to two, then to three, now maybe to four or five days a week back in the office, I fear is going to have a negative effect on those workers, especially because we're seeing some bosses say explicitly, look, if you come in, we'll pay you more. I think that's going to entrench some existing inequalities. I am curious as to why you think we're seeing the rollback. Was the commitment not there to begin with, Sarah, or did something change? You know, that's a great question. I think that when there is a, a sense of an economic expansion that feels limitless, that feels unstoppable, people are more willing to try new things. Certainly the pandemic forced bosses to try some things that maybe they hadn't wanted to try before with remote work and flexibility. Uh, the economic sort of wobbles that we saw this year, even though many indicators remain strong, I think did give CEOs some fear about maybe not what was already happening, but what could happen. So you, you hear about fears of a productivity slowdown, but that hasn't necessarily shown up in data. Um, so I think we're starting to see uh, managers feeling like I've got to have these financial results keep hitting and employees saying, well, we'll, we'll hit it. Um, but maybe some skepticism there from senior executives. Sarah, what could improve that would bring women, people of colour who have found the benefits of a hybrid model back into the office more regularly? Because I can say as a working mum, I like coming to an office because well, I'm a better worker and I'm a better mum on the back of it sometimes. But I can see that flexibility is also joyous. What is curtailing people being able to do so those three days a week in the office, for example? I think there's two main things, and none of them are unfortunately under executive's control. Uh, the one main thing is just uh, 
transportation infrastructure. Commutes in America are long. They are longer than in many other countries. In countries and cities where commutes are shorter or less painful, you do see more people going back to the office because yes, it feels good to put on real clothes and go be with other adults and get out of your house and socialize with your colleagues. Um, unfortunately, making transit better is something that executives really cannot control and that would be very expensive and take years. The second factor uh, is childcare. The U.S. has long had a child care crisis. We saw it really exacerbated during COVID, and it hasn't recovered, particularly for children under the age of three. It is difficult to find high quality care, and it's enormously expensive. If you have two kids in daycare, it could easily eat up your whole salary. So those are, I think, two issues that would make an enormous difference. But unfortunately, they're just not ones that, that managers can be able to affect very well, very much. All right, Sarah, well, then let's circle back to the chart that I showed heading into this discussion here, that gap in participation in the U.S. labor market, the differential between men and women. Give us some sense here as to what you think can actually close that gap in some meaningful way. Well, I think one... Um, one thing that you you know you're just referencing on the screen was paid parental leave. The U.S. is one of the only countries in the world without paid parental leave, or well, any any guaranteed leave. You know, if you work at a small company, you're not even eligible for unpaid leave. Um, I think that's something that really kicks women out of the workforce at a key time in their lives. And then even if they plan to be out of the workforce for a relatively short period, um, it, it can be difficult to get back in. Uh, that keeps older women out of the workforce, too, if they have grandchildren, for example, that they're helping to look after. In the months after a new child is born, about half of families are relying on grandparents to provide childcare because um, there isn't daycare for babies um, of that age, typically. So I think that's something that would affect, you know, not only the, the women who are giving birth to those children, but also the grandmothers who are, are helping to take care of them because most grandparents are still in the workforce. Uh, yeah. One bright spot I want to mention is that we are seeing now record labor force participation. And that is, I think, from, from women, even if it's still below men. So I think that's the gains of, of the pandemic that we saw there, the, the willingness to be flexible on the part of bosses. All right. Well, nice to end on a bright spot, Sarah. Great to catch up with you. Sarah Green Carmichael, they're an economist for us here at Bloomberg Opinion. We continue that conversation right now, diving deeper into the global workforce, the challenges ahead. Kristen Lipton joining us, managing director over at Gallup, which just released its annual report representing, quote, the collective voice of the global employee. Kristen, last time I checked, the collective voice of the global employee was that we want the flexibility to work uh, where we want to work. Is that still not the case? Yes, th thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you today. So the Culture Shock book that you're referring to, Gallup wrote, because we feel like it is such an important time um, to get the message out that this, uh, this, this culture shock, the shift to remote work, is a desire that has, is not changed and it remains. And as leaders, it's a pivotal moment for us to accept that we're not going back to the way things have always been and that the will of the workplace has shifted. So to your point, yes, people still are interested and look for remote work and flexibility when looking for new jobs mm -hmm. um, as a primary factor in that search. Well, when you talk about culture shock, the title of that book here, I think we all acknowledge uh, what the pandemic sort of wrought on us, both good and bad. But it's interesting now to see employers try to push back on that, despite employees making it clear that they see some value to maintaining that. I'm wondering if you anticipate that there will be some structural change in just, I guess, what we think of as work, what we think of at work as workers, and more importantly, how employees pay and cater to those workers uh, in the future. Absolutely. The change is here. Uh, and it, uh, it is something that we, we must uh, address because the idea that, you know, coming back to an office with a mandate, while organizations have to make tough decisions, and there could be some situations where um, being in an office for a highly collaborative role is critically important to the success of the team. Uh, we know in-person time matters. When we look at our engagement data, we know that an optimal balance is more like two to three days a week for remote capable positions, being in an office, because we know that there are um, benefits to remote work that we all experienced, you, uh, certainly referenced in the segment before about the commute time, the impact to the family, um, my own well-being benefiting. Um, so there are some key factors to remote work when we can do our job at home. There are some, some benefits, but in totality for an organization, Organization, we do know that teams are more productive. Engagement is higher when we find an optimal balance of about two to three days per week. 
So the data seems to show that productivity is up if you have more hybrid nature. Why then is, for example, today in the UK, Sir Martin Sorrell saying there's no glue without face-to-face -face and sort of having to rethink about productivity levels. You've got AT&T, they've got a big return to office sort of mandate among managers as well. How, how are these leaders having to navigate whether or not they do land on a four or a five or ultimately is it quite often up to the individual that's dictating it? Right. In, in many cases, leaders are grasping uh, to address a problem that we have seen exist before the pandemic, and that is the manager. So we know that the manager attributes 70 percent to the variance at the local team level. So they play a critical role in engagement of a team. And engagement does connect back to all of the KPIs that we care about, like productivity and turnover. So it's a critically important mess, a metric to watch. Um, so that we know the manager's importance is, is critical. It's been heightened in remote work because we know that remote work makes a manager's job more difficult. And so the single thing that as leaders we could do is, one, figure out for the organization what our values are and what's consistent with our, with our values in terms of getting the balance of hybrid um, right. But, but even particularly more important than that is who we name manager. Mm -hmm. So whatever rules or suggestions, mandates, policies we might put in place um, that dictates or suggests stays in the office, what will make that work is a great manager. Um, in, particular, in particular, training that manager to have the right conversations with their team, um, that's the game changer. And that's typically the conversation that's not happening right now, which is, you know, we, we, we hear leaders grasping at, well, how do I get my team back to the office? And a better question is, how do I pick the right manager and how do I set them up for success? All right, Kristen, this was a great conversation. Kristen Lipton over at Gallup, and we should point out Gallup did uh, publish that book she was referencing, Culture Shock, here. A look here at some of the big structural changes wrought from the pandemic. Coming up here on Bloomberg Equality, a discussion about how global companies stack up on everything from inclusive culture to equal pay. Insights from Bloomberg's Gender Equality Index. That's coming up next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Equality. Over the past seven years, Bloomberg has helped drive global investors' focus on gender equality in the workplace through our Gender Equality Index. The framework invites publicly traded companies to voluntarily disclose data across key pillars like equal pay and inclusive culture. Sophia Sung joining us right now. She heads up the team behind the index. And Sophia, give us some sense here as to how many companies are actually participating in this. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you for having me here today. So in our last cycle, we had over 600 companies participate. And we see progressive year-over-year -year growth. That's about 11% more than the year prior. And what we, it's amazing to see is just that the commitment to both the transparency and the data that's being published on gender reporting. They're opting in. Are they opting from around the world? Is this largely U.S. dominated? Where are we seeing these companies come from? No. Yeah. Great question. So it is very U.S. dominated in that aspect, but we do see regional growth as well. Mm -hmm. For example, last cycle we saw a 20% uptick in APAC or the Asia region with companies disclosing, and we also have first-timer companies domiciled in countries that we haven't seen participate before, which is amazing. Some of those being uh, Kuwait, uh, Luxembourg, as well as Ecuador, and especially tapping into that Middle East region. It's so yeah. great to see that they come out. We're showing some data uh, on the uh, screen right now. Give us a sense here as to actually what this means for our viewers. So when we talk about excellent scores, when we talk about the scores we're giving them here, what are we saying? What are we arriving at? Yeah, absolutely. So we look at our scores based off partially of disclosure. So what of the questions that companies were able to really be transparent about and forthcoming? And as you said, a lot of the data has some sensitivities like pay, um, as well as the other half of, or I should say 70% of the methodology that we use is based off data excellence, a.k.a. a performance score. Mm -hmm. So it's saying how well the data and the numbers they're providing they may be doing against their industry peers or set standards. For example, having 30% or more women on your board has been shown through studies to bring a more inclusive mindset and garner more change. So you've got more people signing up to it. 
But what about the data within? Like, are people getting more excellent? Are people mm. driving forward on diversity or not? Yeah, that's a great question. I think really, it's really interesting to see year to year, especially the last few years, right? When we think about the last fiscal years that passed, we've had COVID. Um, and when we returning back to the workforce, that can really affect the way that the data is coming in and what we're seeing, how that impacts us. So some of the statistics that I think are most notable is really interesting to see companies first leveraging technology mm. to kind of combat some of that. So one of the most scalable, I think, ones is we saw 30% or more companies that are GEI members leveraging machine learning to essentially prevent algorithms from perpetuating gender biases. Mm. And this is so scalable mm. and so important because of the fact that if you think about regular operations, they're already using this technology right, to do that. And all you're doing it is applying it to some workplace um, operations and trying to make and move that in a better direction. Interesting that last week we were talking about AI Absolutely. and bias. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently ML is <laughs> using it to help drive that away. Great to speak with you. Thank you so yeah. much. Really digging into what's happening here with the gender index that we have. Sophia Sung of Bloomberg. Now, back in 2015, you've got to remember this, right? The New York Times piece. Oh, yeah. Look, it ran a story about how fewer women ran big companies than men named John. Just let that sink in. Lauren Harris, a Stanford University economics doctoral student, well, she decided to revisit that issue. She analyzed the share of women CEOs compared to those with the name John or common alternatives like John or Jonathan among a database of more than, well, 1,500 companies. Good news. Women CEOs outnumbered those named John, finally. Lauren. <laughs> I mean, small steps, but you shone a light on this. And just, was it immediate? Was it just in the last year? Did we see steady growth in some way? So the share of women CEOs has been growing over a number of years, um, and the number of women CEOs uh, outgrew the number of CEOs named John fairly soon after the New York Times piece, which was good news. Um, I think what is so kind of shocking about this is we celebrate how much progress we've made. This year is the record for the number of women CEOs in the S&P 500. Um, but when we realized there are only 41 women CEOs in the S&P 500, that's yes. extremely disappointing. Um, and I think people have really gravitated to the statistic in its absurdity, and they find it really funny in a very sad way. Deeply depressing, but sort yeah. of painful humor at times. What's interesting about your field, economics more generally, is how you can look at the impact of inequality or at least shine a light on it in so many different disciplines across economics. What are the ways in which you're trying to drive through some transparency and ultimately will it make change, do you think? Absolutely. So I'm a labor economist. So what labor economists really do is take the temperature of inequality and try and identify um, where we see sources of discrimination or inequity in the data. And we could try to use observable variables to explain those differences. Um, so for example, we've discussed um, on this um, show quite a bit remote work. And mm. um, we know that women are uh, willing to pay essentially or take a lower salary to have more flexible um, hours and to have uh, greater job stability. And that can explain a huge fraction of the early career gap between men and women. Um, yeah, but there's still unobservable factors, mm -hmm. and those are things that behavioral economists try to address. So they try to understand how women's characteristics, um, what they actually do when they're at work, could possibly explain these differences that we observe um, as labor economists. And then there are development economists who look at this issue across the world in all sorts of cultural contexts. Right. Is there any sense, though, Lauren, as to what you found? Like, so, for example, you talk about those differences on the behavioral side. Is there something there that economists have found that provides a bit more of an explanation of why you only end up with 41 CEOs in the S&P 500 that are uh, women? Definitely. So we know that at an elementary school age, girls and boys are equally likely to want to lead a group. Um, they have the same kind of estimation of their own leadership abilities. They do recognize that um, in society, men are more likely to actually be leaders, um, but they don't have, there's not this gender gap in terms of their own ability. By adolescence, this really changes. So the share of girls who are willing to lead a group in the same task that like the nine and 10 year olds are kind of set to um, drops by almost 40%. This is the same age that we see this gap start to form in terms of, um, estimation of one's own ability and performance. Mm. And this changes 
girls and women's willingness to self-promote, um, to tout their own abilities and to kind of advocate for themselves. Yeah. Um, I, I am curious then, I, I, I mean, this is uh, interesting, but it also gets to the issue of how do you address this? We're talking about societal issues, behavioral issues, external issues to that matter, uh, on these girls, and we should point out they are girls at that time. How mm -hmm. do you address that? Through education, through uh, a different way of parenting, or are we just talking about wholesale shifts in how society views and values girls? So I'm not a parent, but if I were, I would really encourage parents to give their daughters activities that are, not, are less open-ended. Of course, open-ended and imaginative play is really important, but giving children tasks that they can't necessarily complete, like puzzles or competitions, games where children might not succeed and they face adversity. Because when we are teaching girls about leadership, we kind of pay lip service to working through adversity, but we don't put girls in situations where they actually face adversity. Boys are given so many more opportunities to lose, to pick themselves back up again, to compare themselves to others and learn from others, um, to get advice. And when girls are engaging in primarily, primarily imaginative play, they're not mm -hmm. doing that as much. Um, so I think those early experiences failing and having your behavior kind of scrutinized and kind of getting over that um, is huge for building girls' self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what leads to this um, competitiveness gap. They found that it's underlying it is sort of this gap in self-esteem. Well, for my current three-year-old daughter, she's obsessed with puzzles, but I'll make sure that that lasts for the time being. Lauren Harris, thank you so much. Stanford University economics doctoral student there. Coming back, we're going to talk more about Bloomberg Equality's takeaways from today's conversations. Plus, look a glimpse into what to expect for the rest of this month's programming. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Equality. I did not realize the discussion on labor markets yeah. was going to immediately have me thinking about the way in which I parent, but clearly that's important. Yeah, Lauren was a fascinating guest, but somewhat sobering as well, because yeah. you realize that a lot of the preconceived notions we have about inequality, they're much deeper. They run much deeper than maybe we And start so early. The yeah. fact that this is something we need to tackle in the schools already, but still manages the key takeaway. They are crucial at this time. Yeah, another great conversation here, and we hope that you continue to watch our special coverage every Thursday through the month of June. We've got so much to come up. Indeed, mm. next week, access to capital. Mm. Look, the world is facing rising interest rates. We just saw them pause for this month. What about the Fed next week? We've got a changing landscape for developing countries in particular, VC, small businesses, looking to financing. Yeah, it's going to be a great show. We really appreciate you tuning in for these really important topics here on Bloomberg Equality. Until next time, from New York, this is Bloomberg.